Good evening and welcome everyone to the League of Women Voters candidate uh, forum for District 11. Um, before we get started, I'm going to have a statement that I'm going to read about the League of Women Voters and kind of an outline of the rules of the forum. Um, so this is the League of Women Voters candidate forum for District 11. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization um, that is its mission is to encourage active and informed participation in government and we also work to increase the understanding of major public policy issues. And we really want to thank the City of Fargo for allowing us to use their facility tonight um, and also for uh, providing the technical assistance uh, as far as um, the recording of the forum is concerned so it can be um, viewed later. Uh, the forum will air on public access um, to widen the number of voters who can see and hear the candidates. Um, on behalf of the League, I want to thank the candidates for attending um, and for the members of the audience for their participation and for writing their questions. <coughs> um, so we're going to give a little bit of a rundown on how the uh, forums operate. Um, so we have invited all the candidates for each district to all of our forums that we're going to be having over the course of the election season. Um, the audience members have been given note cards to write questions for the candidates. Um, if you do have any further questions, um, you can write those down on the note card, just hold it up, um, and one of the volunteers will come around and take the note card um, and bring it up to the moderator. Uh, the questions can be edited for clarity, um, repetition of questions, or we might combine questions to make them um, a little bit more um, succinct, um, and of course also for time. So each candidate will get uh, two minutes to answer the questions. Um, and Lois is going to be timing for us, so please watch the signs um, as Lois is holding those up. Um, we do ask that when she holds up the stop sign that you quickly, you know, just kind of finish your, your sentence or your thought there um, so it doesn't run over into the bell. Um, each candidate will also give um, two minutes for an opening statement and two minutes for a closing statement. So we'll do two minute opening, two minutes answer questions, and two minute closing at the end. Um, we will begin with um, Rod Gugisberg, or Ron Gugisberg, sorry, and then to Mathern you will an like answer the first question. Sec you will be the second person to answer the first question, and then you'll be the first person to answer the second question, and then we'll just rotate around. Um, all right, and that is the statement. We did have one um, candidate, Gretchen Dobrovich, who um, did let us know in advance that she was unable to make it. Um, all candidates who were not able to make it to the forum tonight did have the option to submit a statement, um, which Gretchen did. So I'm gonna read that to get us started off, um, and then we will get started with the questions. Um, so Gretchen's statement reads, um, thank you all who came out today to learn more about the candidates and the League of Women Voters of the Red River Valley for hosting the candidates forum and allowing me to submit a written statement. I regret I'm unable to participate in person today as I'm out of town for my job at the North Dakota State University Public Health Department's American Indian Health Resource Center. Um, it's been an honor to work for the citizens of District 11 over the course of the last two years. I've had the opportunity to meet so many folks um, I work for while assisting them with challenges they're facing, providing information regarding North Dakota's policies, and visiting at events um, and at their doors regarding their wishes for North Dakota today and tomorrow. Uh, meeting citizens' expectations and providing good public service when they need it is something I strive to exceed. As an employee of the people of North Dakota, I've supported policies that assist my fellow state employees in meeting those needs. Um, these include voting to fund statewide radio, which will connect our law enforcement, fire department, and emergency services statewide, vital, vital for disaster response and our security. The most recent oil boom in North Dakota peaked in 2012. While the industry is dramatic, dramatically rebounding, our state budget is still strongly tied to energy and agriculture, both of which have had prices drop severely impacting our economy. Investing in income diversity and developing a responsible personal and corporate state tax structure are building blocks of an economy that works for all citizens while continuing, support, um, while continuing support and investment in our major economic drivers, energy, and agriculture. Manufacturing, technology, and research all offer opportunities for growing North Dakota's economy. Tourism is the number three economic driver in North Dakota behind agriculture and oil, yet the tourism budget um, depart the tourism department budget was cut by 10% in this current budget. A significant portion of tourism dollars are generated in our community. Imagine how investing in this industry could expand not only our economic also opportunities, but also our recreational and retail options. As a social worker working in public health and as a legislator, I'm committed every day to strengthening and supporting North Dakota communities, families, and individuals. 
This includes working as a member on the Health Services and Healthcare Reform Interim Committees, advocating for accessible and affordable health care, listening to our families touched by substance use disorder, and promoting their ideas for how to address this epidemic stealing our loved ones. I voted for an increased state minimum wage as a member of the Industry, Business, and Labor Committee. North Dakota businesses cannot survive if North Dakotans can't afford basic living expenses or occasional small luxuries like dinner out in a movie. Like my family, most of my neighbors in District 11 or their ancestors came to North Dakota in pursuit of the American dream. In the North Dakota House of Representatives, I championed education funding, income equality, and human rights, all factors for success. Through creating opportunities for North Dakotans to achieve their American dream, we're strengthening not just our nation and state, but our neighbors. I believe in North Dakota investing in North Dakotans. Being appointed to serve my neighborhood in the North Dakota State Legislature was a childhood dream come true, and I hope that my bosses, the voters of District 11, will keep me on staff in the North Dakota House of Representatives on November 6th. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to participate in today's forum. So I just want to say again, that was a written statement provided by Gretchen Dobrovich, who let us know that she was not able um, to be here tonight. As I said, all um, candidates did have the option to submit a written statement, um, though Gretchen was the only one that had done so in advance. So we will go ahead with the questions. Um, what's that? Oh, that's right, the opening statements. Yep, thank you. Um, so Gugisberg, is that how you pronounce it? correct, yeah. Okay, Very all right. Good. So Ron Gugisberg, if you would start us off with your opening statement, please. Thank you very much. Uh, that's one of my favorite things in committee in the legislatures, watching people try to pronounce Gugisberg. But um, thank you to the League of Women Voters for putting this on. And um, it's, it's great to have an opportunity to talk to the voters. And for, for those that can't be here tonight, they can stream it uh, and see what our views are. Um, the reason I was a little late, so I hope I got all the rules down, was I was at an education meeting uh, in Bismarck, just hopped out of the car off I-94 and ran up here. So. Uh, a little bit about myself. I was first elected in 2010. Uh, been in the legislature for four sessions now. Been on most of the committees already. Um, and so I've kind of got the lay of the land. The one, I guess the big takeaway I would have after my four sessions is, um, you know, w w when we're driving east on I-94 after the last day of the session, uh, we listen to the radio and there are people uh, calling in and, and well, can you grade the legislature? How did the session go? And the majority party will say, you know, A's. It went great. Minority party will say it was terrible. Um, but I think there is a way to, to judge how we did for our constituents, and that's to see how close we represented them. And there's been a few things over the years. Uh, I just jotted a few down here just now. Um, for example, there was a vote to cut income taxes and corporate taxes. Every county in the state rejected that, every county. Um, we've reduced those, the three previous sessions to this one. Um, oil taxes, uh, the oil tax rate was set by the voters. Um, that was something that was changed by the, by the majority party in the legislature, um, even though the people said it should be uh, at the previous rate. Medical marijuana is another great example of with the will of the people not being followed. Um, they've been dragging their feet and pretty soon we're gonna be into our next session and still no medical marijuana uh, uh, process in place. And then a few upcoming ones, Sunday closing was almost on the ballot. Uh, I'm, I'm certain that would have passed. Ethics Commission is going to be on the ballot. I'm certain that's gonna pass. These are all examples of things that were either on the ballot or are going to be on the ballot, and I'm co pretty confident they're gonna pass, uh, that the legislature has failed to vote positively on. All right, thank you. Candidate Tim Mathern, your opening statement. Thank you, uh, and uh, thank you to the League and the citizens that are listening this evening. Um, I have served in the North Dakota legislature since 1986. My uh, first term, was a term when we had a special session called because of budget difficulties. And I just want to uh, tell folks that the budget difficulties of 1986 were huge compared to what they are now. We talk about a budget difficulty, but it really is out of considerable income that we have now that's been temporarily reduced versus at that time when we had a crisis in all sectors of the economy. 
But that leads me to give the three reasons why I want the citizens to vote for me this fall. First reason is I am experienced. I have served in almost every um, committee of the legislature. I have served in the majority party. I have served in the minority party as those have changed through the years. The, the, the Democrats are now the minority party. Republicans are the majority party. There was a time when the Democrats were the majority in the Senate and the Republicans were the minority. I remember those days. The experience is not just in the committees I've served on, it also is related to the Appropriations Committee that I serve on. Almost every issue comes through that committee in terms of how it is funded. Secondly, I ask the citizens to vote for me because I'm engaged in the community. I'm a member of Nativity Parish. I work at Prairie St. John's. I've helped start a small business, Prairie Roots Food Co-op. I manage a VISTA program. I serve on the, um, the School of Medicine and Health Sciences Board. I'm involved in very broad areas of concern in our community. The third reason that I ask the voters to vote for me this fall is because of my interest and awareness of the needs of the people in District 11. And I would just note three of them. One is property tax, which has been yo-yoing in terms of the policy set in Bismarck. We need to stabilize property tax reduction. Secondly, we need the diversion to prevent floods in the future. There is no question that that is a high priority. And third, I would bring up the issues that relate to everyone's needs, and that is behavioral health and education. And I think we have a crisis in behavioral health. We have 150 suicides per year. And in education, we have a wonderful university in our city, North Dakota State University, which is really the forefront of considerable economic development in our state. And funding for the university should not be reduced. So I ask the citizens to uh, vote for me because of those reasons. All right, thank you. Um, so, Tim Mathern, you will start us off with the first question, um, which is, how long have you lived in District 11, and what do you like best about it? I have lived actually in three different districts, not because I've moved, but because the legislature has changed the lines. Uh, I have lived in the territory that is now called District 11 since 1976. And um, at one time, our district was called 51. At one time, 21 went that way. But now it's District 11. So I like the district because it's such a wonderful mix of uh, single family dwellings. We have wonderful schools in our district. And we have a um, small business sector. So it's a very diverse district. And it's close to, you know, the exciting things going on downtown, but it's also close to the uh, interstate, uh, interstate 94 on one side, interstate 29 on the other. So transportation is really easy. And uh, I also like our parks. We have a wonderful park system. I just live within blocks of Lindenwood Park, and there's just no greater place in the city. I enjoy my district. Thank you. Ron Gugisberg? Well, uh, I've lived in our district about 11 years, a little over 11 years. And the way I can always remember that is when we moved in, my wife was out to here with my 11-year-old son. So um, been there 11 years. Things I love about District 11 is, you know, the 
the diversity in the different neighborhoods. Um, you know, we have the old part of District 11 over like along 8th Street in that area, Lindenwood Park. Um, and then oh, I live in the South High neighborhood and it's a little newer neighborhood and uh, a lot of young families there. Um, and it, same as uh, Senator Mathern, I like the parks. Um, but I guess most of all, it's the, I think this is the area of the city, maybe this in downtown where uh, neighborhood is really important to people. Um, we have a lot of small schools, small neighborhoods, and everybody uh, feels comfortable with each other and um, gets along great. All right, thank you. So uh, for our next question, um, there, there's kind of two separate questions depending on if you are an incumbent or a challenger. So for incumbents, um, what is your most important accomplishment that you think justifies re-election? And for challengers, um, why would you do a better job than the incumbent? Um, so Ron Gugisberg, we'd start with you. Well, thank you. Um, so I, I would say my, my biggest accomplishment is to, to be a good member of the minority party. Um, I, it took me a little while to realize uh, the importance of a strong minority party to keep the majority party in check. Uh, last session, um, <laughs> my son was sitting with the floor, sitting on the floor with me one day, and after the session, I had a bill come up, and it had to do with studying revenue volatility. And I gave my speech. Uh, some people supported it, and then the vote came up, and it went down. Um, my son asked me why it went down because he thought it was a pretty good idea and so did I and I said well I'll tell you later and so the the session got over we left we're walking down the hallway and we ran into the majority leader Al Carlson and I said uh, excuse me representative Carlson my son has a question for you he was too shy and I think uh, representative Carlson was too set aback to answer right away so I asked him I said um, he wants to know why my bill failed. And uh, the majority leader said something like, well, it just needs some more time to stew or something like that. So eventually what happened was, it was a good bill. It was amended on the, one of the bills in the, the last two weeks of the session and passed. I sit on that committee and we are studying revenue volatility. So um, sometimes when we get things done in the minority, um, it has to be done in a different way than just putting your name on the top of a bill and passing it. All right, thank you. Tim Mather, the same question. What are you, um, what is your most important accomplishment that you think justifies re-election? You know, I think um, one of the things that's most important for the district is being open to every citizen on a bill idea they have. When I begin a legislative session each time, I usually have a stack of bills, and they're basically citizen ideas. A citizen will call me, and I don't judge every aspect of their request. I try to get a bill drafted so, so I can support the citizen in their view. We have a citizen-led legislature, and we ought to be very open to our citizens. And then, what I do is I ask people around the legislature, who would like to sponsor this bill or co-sponsor it? And uh, if you note that the bills I've introduced, there's probably almost every one that's got both Republicans and Democrats on it. And uh, so I, I would say that would be my, um, my highest accomplishment is being able to kind of work with various ideas, whatever they are, without prejudging, and then working across the aisle and doing what I can to get bills passed with the Republicans and Democrats working together. All right, thank you. So Tim Mathern, our next question will start with you. Um, it is, what would you propose to increase access to mental health and addiction services? Um, how does your background prepare you for this challenge? About six years ago, we had a report regarding the behavioral health needs in North Dakota. It was conducted by uh, an outside specialist, Renee Schulte, which came up with the Schulte Report, which had a number of recommendations. Most of those recommendations were not accepted by the Republican legislature. 
In fact, we're um, defeated. And then the executive branch had a study conducted. That's over the past two years. And it's summarized in what we call the HSRI report. That has 13 recommendations. They're essentially very close to the Schulte report. And I don't think we need to nitpick about any of the individual recommendations. I believe each and every recommendation of the HSRI report should be adopted by the legislature. I call on Governor Burgum. As these came out of the executive branch of government, he is in charge of the Department of Human Services. I ask him to put the recommendations in his budget. And if he does not, I would say he has wasted a lot of money in coming up with the recommendations. So to summarize, let's adopt those 13 recommendations and they cross the, 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 the bow from more prevention services to more clinical services in our facilities. I work at a psychiatric hospital. I understand these issues, but this is a broader than an acute care issue. It's also prevention. How do we keep people well so they don't need psychiatric service? That's important that we solve that. All right. Ron Gugisberg. Well, I don't know if I want to follow Senator Mather on this one because he is definitely one of the experts on this. And uh, the other expert will be coming up next, Kathy Hogan. But um, definitely, uh, as a firefighter, one thing I do understand is prevention is the best way to, you know, uh, keep from spending a lot of money on a lot of risk. And so there are things not only in mental health. I mean, I think when, when we think of treating mental health, we think of uh, you know, maybe seeing a psychiatrist or something, but these mental health issues are sometimes caused by uh, other things that are going on in the home. And so all of these, uh, you know, whether it's through education, law enforcement, um, or, or, or the mental health professionals, we need them to get working together uh, to find a solution and, and get to the root problem and take care of it. Um, <clears throat> the big, you know, Senator Mathern mentioned putting it in the budget, and that is that is the issue. It's it's paying for it, and I think the reason that we have a hard time paying for these things is because of the way we we account in in politics. I wouldn't say government, but politics, and we don't look at outcomes. So we don't we don't ask ourselves if we don't invest in this program, what is it going to cost? not only us in this budget cycle, but in the next few budget cycles or the life of that person or generations. Um, and so if we put those costs along with the um, you know, taxes needed to pay for it, it would make sense for a lot of these things uh, to invest the proper amount and take care of the problem right away. Okay, thank you. So for our next question, we'll start with Ron Gugisberg. Um, what does North Dakota need to do to counter our labor shortage? Uh, well, I did an interesting meeting last week. Uh, it was about State Bank of North Dakota, but uh, one of our uh, local entrepreneurs was there. And he said that, you know, the people we're looking for to diversify our economy um, are, you know, are thought of as in the tech sector, maybe a, a younger generation. And you know, his idea was people don't look for a job and then move to that place. Uh, younger people now, they want to live in a place that they love. And so we need to make North Dakota and Fargo uh, a place that people love to live. If we want people to work here um, and they're interested in recreation, we need to invest in more recreation. If we want people to move here because it's a safe community, we need to invest more in public safety and prevention. And if we want people to move here to raise a family and then find a job here, uh, the number one thing, and if you ask realtors, they'll tell you where the good and bad schools are. Um, the number one thing we could do is invest in education. 
both pre-K, K through 12, and higher education. Um, if you're thinking about what you want for your family, um, the number one thing is to take care of your children and give them a great opportunity, and they get that through the education process. All right, thank you. Tim Mathern. Yes, it's very important that we solve our um, shortage of labor in our state. Our economy is essentially stagnated because of the fact that we don't have a sufficient number of people to address the jobs, to take the jobs that we have available. And I would, I would second um, Representative Gugasberg's comments about making sure there is a quality place. And that doesn't just include Fargo, North Dakota. That includes the other cities around North Dakota. And we need to do everything we can to make sure all of these cities and towns are quality. But we need important income. Uh, for example, with these tariffs and what's going on in terms of farm prices, we're actually going to lose more people from the farms, from the rural areas. And that's negative, um, not just for that family, but for that little community and the school that's there or the hospital or the business. So we need to address those kinds of things. I also think we need to be um, positive about promoting immigration to our state. Um, you know, we have these people that complain about the fact that we have reciprocity and tuition for Minnesota students coming here. Hey, that's the best deal possible. Not only it's got a job for our education officials and, and, and staff, but when a student comes here from Minnesota or Iowa or Montana, they get to love the place and they're going to stay. So we need to be uh, attentive to that. We also need to welcome our immigrants and refugees that are escaping other places in the world. They are important members of our community. They are the new citizens. They are the ones working in our hospitals, working in our nursing homes, working in all of the landscaping that's going on in this city. You, you look around and it's those people that are taking care of all of those jobs. We need them, we should welcome them, and we should even be more supportive than we are right now. So part of it is better quality of life, and the other part is being very positive about promoting immigration. Thank you. Um, so our next question would be, uh, starting with Tim Mathern, um, what is your view on the governor's call for more spending cuts, and does, um, North Dakota need to enhance its revenue? Well, it's interesting. The governor cuts are across the board. I do not find that as an acceptable leadership model. A straight across the board cut is not really making any tough decisions. It is keeping what's mediocre and making it less mediocre, keeping something very positive and challenging, challenging it to become mediocre. <clears throat> if the governor believes there isn't enough money, I suggest the governor should literally make changes in terms of what should be cut and what should be enhanced so that we don't mush out so that every public service in the state is of lower quality. So that's one thing. The second thing is, I really do believe there are resources in our state. Um, we have, in fact, been putting money away. And there are resources that we can use for important needs, and I believe we should use those resources. To keep everything down into the future, um, is really a short-sighted point of view. Um, we have families all over our city, all over our district, that are in houses that they love, and they raise 
families that they love. They, they have a neighborhood. All of those families made a, a, a projection about what they could spend in their lifetime and what they could borrow to have a quality of life. We need to do the same thing as a state. We need to project what our needs are, pay for those things that are important, and uh, I think there's a lot more resources available than the governor is um, speaking about at this time. Thank you. So Ron Gugesberg, so the question, what is your view on the governor's call for more spending cuts, and does North Dakota need to enhance revenue? Well, two examples in the last couple of weeks here. First of all was uh, when we met with the state bank, uh, asked about the cuts, and they're expected to make the 10% cuts as well. In a time when they're making record profits, which we use to, uh, we've just started doing this, used to um, fund, help fund the general fund uh, government, we shouldn't be taking a uh, organization that is making us record profits and providing wonderful services to the citizens of North Dakota and tell them to cut 10%. That's not how business is run and that's not how we should run government. Um, also today, we, I was at an education committee meeting and somebody from the ITD, the technical um, uh, department at uh, the state, said that you know they're going to need to increase their workforce by you know it was 27 i believe just in cybersecurity um, so there's some issues in certain departments where we're going to need to increase funding and there may be some departments that we can decrease funding in but we can't just take a broad brush and and say a 10 percent cut is the way to go uh, so hopefully we can uh, come out with a better budget than a 10% cut across the board. The other thing that really concerns me is um, what's going on at the federal level. We've had some massive tax cuts that are, is causing our deficit to uh, climb astronomically, and we are going to have to cut some spending at the federal level. And when federal spending gets cut, rural states like ours get hurt. Um, we are dependent on things like, uh, you know, crop insurance. Um, we're, we need them for things like big federal projects like the FM diversion. Uh, if there's a flood, we need them to help us out uh, afterwards. And, and the list goes on and on and on. These, this federal spending to New York City means very little. It means a whole lot to a state like North Dakota. All right. So our next question will begin with um, Ron Gugesberg. Um, can the state of North Dakota do anything to control the increasing property taxes? Uh, short answer, yes. Um, <clears throat> now, when the oil boom first started, we had revenue surpluses. So um, it was time to you know, spend money on one-time things that we needed and uh, reduce some of the taxes. So we did, and we reduced corporate taxes, we reduced income taxes, and we reduced property taxes. This last session, there was a bust, and we increased property taxes, and that was it. Now, the way we did it, um, or going from the, the strict buy-down of property taxes to funding other things was a good move. Um, I think uh, funding, uh, Human services at the county level um, was something that we needed to do because of all the restrictions we put on them. But we could have done more. Um, we could have at least kept property tax buy down money whole and maybe put it into like the state aid distribution or something to get that money back out uh, to the communities. Um, I mentioned in my opening remarks that the voters turned down income and corporate tax cuts when it went to the ballot. Um, they also turned down getting rid of property taxes. They want a balanced tax base. And I agree with them. The problem is since 2010, um, that tax base or the, the tax revenue as a percentage of the, the general fund has become more and more reliant on sales taxes and less and less on income and corporate taxes. And what that does to people uh, who are middle income or lower income is it makes them carry more of the, the burden. All right, 
Thank you. Tim Mather. Uh, property taxes are generally uh, the domain of the local decision makers. And I, I think that's important that our city commissions, our um, public school boards, our park commissions, all of these local bodies, county commissions, they should really be in charge of the property tax to the greatest extent. And we should permit them to really determine what level is needed to meet the needs of the citizens. Now, the state can sort of decide for these political subdivisions what to do. I don't think we should do that. We have different levels of government for a good reason. And the state of North Dakota is not as able to figure out whether we ought to put a parking lot <clears throat> outside the library here as the city of Fargo is. And the city of Fargo um, relies on property taxes for doing those kinds of things. So I think that's important. However, we can do some things. I, for example, believe that the state should involve itself more in the area of the home ta homestead tax credit, where the state makes a decision as to how much of the property taxes should be not levied for each homeowner. Homeowners should get the break on a property tax. Homeowners, the state of North Dakota homeowners should get the benefit of a property tax reduction because it is the homeowners that live here who make the scouts work and make the library board work, who make the League of Women Voters work, that have the churches work, have the schools work. Citizens who actually have a house here and a home actually run the state. They should get the property tax, should be done through the homestead tax credit, and not this across the board blanket reduction in property taxes. All right, thank you. So our next uh, question will begin with Tim Mathern. Um, should the state of North Dakota work harder to prevent um, construction in flood zones? And this, uh, there's a note on the top, especially in view of uh, North Carolina's floods um, and some of the, I don't know, kind of catastrophic flooding we've seen events um, around the United States. So the question is, should the state um, work harder to prevent construction in flood zones? Well, I think uh, flood zones um, should, in fact, be staying as flood zones. Um, I have introduced legislation um, called Greenways, wherein we actually have green spaces along rivers. And I think it's very appropriate that we, as a state, designate space along rivers that flood so that that space is not used for building. So I'm very supportive of that. And the green space is not wasted space. We all need recreation. We all need um, experiences with nature. And I believe that um, citizens of any city um, appreciate those kinds of amenities. So it's not land that's lost. It's just land that's used in a different way. And I'm very supportive of keeping floodways to be floodways. Ron Gugisberg, should the state work harder to prevent construction in flood zones? Um, I guess I'm not really sure what, how the state is involved other than, you know, with, with our engineers and with the, the water department, they, um, you know, before we'll fund a project, we, we check to make sure that uh, uh, people aren't building in very risky areas. Um, and the problem is that some areas that we thought were maybe not as risky all of a sudden are. Uh, when, we, when we have 100-year uh, floods every few years uh, in a row, then um, you know, we start to realize that maybe our calculations were wrong. Um, I just, um, I guess I'm with, with Senator Mathern that uh, if we can use these flood zones, um, as a place for recreation, uh, that's great. Um, and yeah, that's about it. 
All right, so um, if you don't mind just straying from the rules just a, a little bit here. So we had one question that was just a yes or no question. So um, Ron Gugesberg, we would start with you. Um, I will just do a quick yes or no answer and then move on to another question um, just to kind of shake things up a little bit. So the question is, would you support bonding for Dunbar Hall at NDSU? Uh, yes or no? Yes, I would support bonding for Dunbar Hall. Okay, thank you. Tim Mather? Certainly, but we don't even have to do bonding. We can pay cash for it. Okay. It's, a, it's a building ready to explode. We ought to redo it. No question. All right, so um, Tim Mather, our next question, we'll start with you. Um, should legacy fund interest be used for one time or ongoing examples and, or ex ongoing expenses, excuse me, and what types of expenses would you um, basically approve to use legacy fund interest for? I go to the term itself of the fund, legacy. I believe we ought to use the legacy fund, but we ought to use it for items that have a legacy impact, that have a long-term impact. So I don't think we ought to use legacy funds for putting an inch of blacktop on a road, but we ought to use legacy funds for building green buildings that are going to last 100 years, and that we do it in such a way that they are top quality 100-year buildings and not quonsets we build up. There's a lot of legacy needs um, that our state has, and I believe we ought to use a legacy fund for a portion of that. I don't think we ought to, um, I think we ought to use it in terms of the, the interest and not the principal at this point, but um, infrastructure kind of projects, education kind of projects that have legacy impact, we ought to use that legacy fund for. Thank you. Ron Gugesberg. All right. You sure you don't want me to talk for two more minutes about uh, building and flood zone? <laughs> All right. Um, I agree with Senator Mathern that we should not spend any of the principal in the legacy fund, uh, but the interest is something that we may want to spend uh, money from. I, I don't like that we're starting to use it for general fund uh, expenses already because then it just becomes easier and easier. And I remember when the boom first started and economists would come to North Dakota and, and warn us of the, uh, I think it was called the, the paradox of surplus or something like that, where uh, w when you have a very energy rich area and they d become too dependent on that one uh, commodity, it can hurt the rest of the economy and um, it hurts the diversity in the economy. And so maybe that's what we should be using uh, that interest for, is figure out, you know, what are we gonna do next? What's North Dakota gonna be next? What's North Dakota want to be next? And how do we position ourselves there? Um, I heard that the, the presidents of the universities uh, at UND and NDSU are interested in funding more research. To me, um, if it is you know, well thought out, of course, and something that we're sure we can uh, get a good return on, that would be a great place to use that interest. All right, thank you. So for our next question, um, we've had a, a couple actually questions on some of the ballot measures um, that are coming up in North Dakota, um, but a couple specifically on measure one, um, which is the anti-corruption amendment. And um, one of the questions you did point out, um, some news that I had not heard, that today the ACLU announced opposition to measure one. Um, and just the way the question's written, it makes it sound as if perhaps this opposition was um, due to issues over free speech. Um, but just wondering, do you have a position um, on the measure one, the anti-corruption measure um, that's on the November ballot? So I think, uh, Ron Gugesberg, we start with oh, you. All right. Um, yeah, I support measure one. Uh, it's, uh, we've been trying to get some common sense legislation passed uh, since I've been there in 2011 uh, on campaign finance law uh, rules and uh, just general ethics commissions um, with no luck. So I think I'm glad that somebody put it on the ballot and we have an opportunity to vote for it. All right. Tim Mather? I think uh, measure one is the citizens attempt 
to get more transparency into government, to, to make sure that money that flows into campaigns is adequately documented, to make sure that there are some rules about a legislator or somebody else becoming a, a lobbyist immediately after serving in the legislature. So measure one is attempting to solve some serious concerns in our state, and I think it's an important measure to pass. Now, there will be issues and there will be disparate points of view. But if you read measure one, it's, it's quite broad in terms of permitting change as is needed and the change can be addressed by the legislature. So it's not a, a very rigid document in that regard. It does give some leeway, but it establishes the principle that there ought to be transparency. And if there are issues that the ACLU or somebody else has about the measure, we address those issues. But we set the principle that transparency is positive, transparency is what people want, transparency is what's good for government. All right, so we're gonna do one final question um, and then we'll do the uh, two minute wrap up statements. Um, so the question, uh, which we'll start with Tim Mathern, what should the legislature's top priority be when it meets again next year? The top priority of the legislature um, really should be adequately meeting the needs of our citizens. The needs of our citizens um, are generally around um, education, taking care of the people that are most vulnerable, that's in human services, and making sure that there are public services available for everyone when they need them. And I don't care if that's getting a driver's license or it's having a proper road or human services or education. We have government for a reason. That's meeting the needs of citizens. That's the priority. The priority is not meeting the needs of certain industries. The priority is meeting the needs of our citizens. Okay, and Ron Gugesberg, what should be the legislator's top priority in January? Uh, well, that's an interesting question. Um, so I think if, if we take that as uh, what should the legislature prioritize as they have in the past, um, you know, it can be things like balancing out the tax structure, funding, like uh, Senator Mathern said, things that need to be funded. Um, but if we take the question as what I think the legislature should prioritize, I think that it should prioritize how it does business. Uh, right now, we meet every two years for four months, take a stab at what's gonna happen in the next two years, and then there's, oh yeah, there's an election mixed in there too. Um, we need to take a long-term look at what we're making in North Dakota, what our resources are, what our future looks like, and start funding those priorities. Uh, once we know what, what we want North Dakota to look like, and once we know um, how we get a plan to get there, then we can decide whether we should raise or lower taxes or give uh, certain people tax benefits, things like that. Um, but yeah, so I guess my, if, if I could choose the priority, it would be uh, better accounting um, in the legislature and a longer term vision for the legislature. Okay, thank you. So for our closing statements, we'll begin with Ron Gugesberg. Um, <clears throat> well, thanks again for having us. Um, thanks for uh, Senator Mathern joining me up here. Uh, <laughs> and uh, well, if, if I would have known, um, I would have probably had Gretchen just write my comments because after listening to hers, those were very well thought out. And, um, but no, I, I appreciate the honor that the people of District 11 have given me to represent them for the last four sessions. Um, it, uh, it's been enlightening. Uh, I've learned a lot about 
uh, our state and, and how our state operates and, you know, made, I, I believe, influenced uh, some policy decisions that uh, help not only our district but the entire state. Uh, I hope that the voters of District 11 will, will give me a chance to, to go back out and uh, fight for them again. Um, things I'm going to be focusing on is, uh, like I said earlier, uh, leveling the tax system so it's more fair for middle class people and um, benefits North Dakota. Uh, also education funding. Education funding is going to be uh, an issue in the future I think as our budgets continue to be cut. Uh, that's something we need to keep an eye on is education funding. I think that is the biggest role that the state and just government in general has is, is educating its people. Um, so that, that should be prioritized. Um, and finally, uh, just like I said in my last answer, um, just thinking about things a little differently, thinking about things a little more long term, and uh, thinking about looking for outcomes instead of uh, what does it cost. All right, and Tim Mather, your closing statement. Thank you. Um, I, I want to express how important this is not only for the citizen to vote but the legislator to legislate to being a legislator um, is a very high honor it is a high honor it's also a high responsibility frankly I don't know what other roles in life really are more important than sort of setting out what the structures of our society will be, what are the rules and regulations we will use to live with each other in harmony. Um, I don't really know where that is done any more than a state legislature. So I, I, uh, I, I take that role seriously and I ask our citizens to do the same. And I ask our citizens now, particularly um, with the turmoil that is being expressed in our news each day, to take more time around the family table, um, take more time between the adults and with children about what is it that we want for a democracy? What is it that we want in our leaders? And what is it that we will individually do to make sure that that happens? So we need every citizen to engage. Uh, I really appreciate the support of citizens in District 11. I ask you to vote for me this fall. And uh, I assure you, I will work very hard for all of those issues that I've spoken apart about and I will take the part of a legislator that is working with all different points of view to come to a consensus, to come to a point of view that actually fits for our state. So I thank you the League for your work. I thank you Representative Gugesberg um, for being with me this evening and I thank the citizens for taking part. Have a good evening. All right, thank you. So we have a couple announcements quick here to wrap up. Um, so we want to thank the audience for their participation and writing some really great questions for our candidates tonight. Um, we want to thank the League of Women Voters volunteers. Uh, really wouldn't be possible um, without this. We are a volunteer organization as well. Um, our, um, our local league chapter is all volunteers, so it's, it's all um, effort that we do um, after work and, and on weekends. Um, and then also we want to thank the city of Fargo for their support as well in the forums tonight. Um, and of course a really big thanks to our candidates. It's a really busy time for you guys. Um, there's a lot, everything to do of course when you're campaigning. So we really appreciate you taking the time um, and the effort for our democracy to help make sure that the citizens of Fargo are, are informed. And I think it makes people more likely to participate when they are informed. Um, if you had a question that you did not get answered, um, hopefully the candidates would you know, stick around, maybe talk with you in the hallway for a little bit. Um, we'll kind of reset up the room here and our next form starts at is it 7 15 all right um, also just really quickly this is the very first candidates forum of the season so we have multiple more coming in fargo multiple more coming in moorhead 
Um, if you want to know more about when those forms are, they're posted to our Facebook page. There's events there and then also on our website. Um, so please come back and join us for uh, more of those candidates' forms, including the, like, the Cass County Sheriff's one that's going to be October 9th. Um, we also are just finishing up work on our North Dakota Voters Guide. So we have prepared a voters guide um, that has information about each one of the proposed measures on the ballot. Um, just explaining what a yes vote means, what a no vote means, um, just to kind of help give clarity to that issue when people go to vote in November. Um, and then also, just as a quick announcement, our next First Friday meeting, um, which is October 5th, um, from noon to 1 at the Sons of Norway, is going to be information on how to vote. Um, so we have the Clay County Auditor is sending some information, and then the Cass County Auditor is sending a representative. So if you have questions or need information on you know, what are the rules for voting? How, how do you do it? What do you need to bring with you? Um, that would be the perfect opportunity for you. So thanks to the audience and the candidates.